I'm very excited to, to uh, welcome Rajesh Kadam, an entrepreneur in residence at 500 Startups. He's also an angel slash crypto investor. Let's welcome Rajesh. Hey, thank you for having me on the show today. Very happy to be here. And uh, hello to all the listeners out there. Great. So um, thank you for um, taking the time to join our show. So, Absolutely. Uh, so mind sharing with us um, more about yourself and um, what you do and how is your experience at 500 Startups? I'm sure our audience would like to hear more about it. Sure, absolutely. So as an entrepreneur in residence at 500 Startups, I work with uh, you know, a bunch of startups there um, in various capacities. Uh, so for example, one thing I did recently was I wrote the uh, curriculum for the growth curriculum for pre-series A startups, the new program that 500 is starting. So, um, you know, covered a bunch of my experience and all the kind of doing a deep dive on all the different topics that a founder that's at a pre-series A stage should know, for example. So that's one. And I get a chance to work with uh, founders, uh, cool founders, especially in the enterprise B2B space, uh, which is kind of where uh, my background is, uh, but generally on go-to-market and marketing um, and overall strategy. Um, and also crypto, actually, I've just started working with a, a startup uh, that's the intersection of um, supply chain and crypto, uh, decentralized finance. So um, I love working Exciting with time. crypto startups, especially. So. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I uh, love working with uh, founders, people doing uh, innovative things that bring uh, real value, you know, to the community and grow the overall ecosystem. I'm glad That's you're part of one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, five hundred startups is great. Working it gives me a chance to uh, be on the cutting edge, if you will, of technology. I'm sure uh, you meet a lot of like-minded individuals and. You know, people who are always growing, people who are so into startups and um, into making a difference in the world, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I firmly believe that I think technology has the potential and continues to transform, uh, you know, how we live and how we work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, definitely, I believe in the power of technology to bring about change. Um, so. Uh, it's a privilege to uh, work with founders, you know, who are working on innovative, interesting ideas, uh, for sure. And 500 um, is all over the world. Um, they have, I don't know the exact number, probably 40, 50 offices across the world, yeah, accelerators slash incubators. So you get to, you know, I work with people in like Middle East, India, North America, I met founders okay. from, I don't know, yeah, uh, former Soviet Union, so different places actually, so. <laughs> uh southeast asia so it's, it's quite an interesting break in terms of geography and uh, different sectors from which these startups are great mind sharing uh what kind of startup do you do mm -hmm. uh so i uh you know so uh my career in the valley uh, in silicon valley has spanned for the last i don't know 17 years now and i uh, worked with many, many different startups in this time frame, either in full-time or consulting capacities. And uh, for part of the time, um, I used to run a small agency of my own um, um, where I used to, yeah, uh, do go-to-market for different startups, go-to-market strategies, essentially, on um, either uh, the product early on, the product, and figuring out how to, uh, you know, actually take it to market and get, get it known. Right uh, or two, uh, you gain some traction. Um, so you know you've already found what is called as product market fit, meaning you know there is a demand for the kind of product that you are selling. Uh, and now the question is, how do you scale the growth uh, in a way that's sustainable, right? And eventually will take you to profitability at some point. So um, <clears throat> so that 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 was an interesting you know entrepreneurial journey uh, in and of itself for me. Uh, to to kind of grow uh, revenues, work with yeah startups. Uh, uh, some of them have gone IPO now, so uh, oh, it's wow. been pretty interesting. Yeah, company, couple of companies, uh, C3.ai, uh, which is a uh, AI uh, play, 
um, and another company called JFrog, for example, which is into DevOps. So both of them were clients of mine and um, oh, so you helped them actually earlier this year. So you help them market, right? You're the marketing guy. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Perfect. So, so what kind of marketing do you specialize in? So like, um, are you um, doing the marketing to build their the company's reputation or uh, for services or for products? Uh, right. Yeah, so a lot of my a um, lot of my work uh, is focused on what is called as growth marketing. Um, uh, so, which is around building revenue pipeline. So, how do you, <clears throat> if a company has to generate, let's say, ten million dollars in annual recurring revenue, uh, right? How do you get to that number? You have to back up from that revenue number all the way to saying, okay, what does our, um, you know, how many people do we need to get, um, so to speak, in the funnel? What is called as a funnel uh, of number of people that we need to reach either through you know uh, you know press mentions or showing up on TV or having a billboard um, or just running Google ads and so on and so forth right or showing up at conferences so how do we build demand uh, for your products um, so that there's enough critical mass of people who are interested uh, and then talking to all of these people figuring out some of them will then you know eventually uh, convert meaning uh, they'll they'll have deeper interest in your product maybe do a demo with you and maybe the demo will turn into a a sales conversation, right? Uh, where they may eventually decide to buy from you and they may talk to competitors as well. So question becomes, okay, how do you differentiate? Uh, what's your unique offering and so on and so forth. So a um, lot of these strategies come into play. And then of course, also on the product side today, uh, a lot of uh, marketing uh, or growth that comes uh, is uh, from the product led growth, meaning how do you embed functionality within your products um, in such a way that the growth will build in and of itself with zero marketing, so to speak. People love your product so much that you embed capabilities within your product. Um, like Slack is a good example, um, even LinkedIn. Uh, I mean, so you can embed virality, uh, Uber, um, you know, the Uber app uh, where you embed mm -hmm. virality in such a way that, um, you know, things sort of snowball and you begin to see solid scale uh, yeah virality is a huge part of marketing and content for sure yeah right 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 exactly i mean you you are on tiktok so you yeah. know about uh, <laughs> how things go viral right yeah uh, TikTok uh, just reached a billion users so yeah yeah you want to focus on virality <laughs> in all right especially um, short clips content like tiktok mm -hmm. right Right, right. I think short form content has taken off in the last couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially around Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, mm -hmm. um, right? So yeah. I mm -hmm. think that 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 uh, form factor is definitely here to stay, especially with the whole mobile revolution. Uh, so much of our content consumption is from mobile as well, from our cell phones. Yeah. So I think um, uh, definitely um, that's an important area to watch out. Great. So um, as uh, someone who is an investor slash entrepreneur, what's uh, your outlook on um, investing in general and economy and also uh, VCs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we are living in very interesting times, uh, interesting tumultuous times, I guess. Uh, <laughs> there's so much happening, so much, so much happening. Uh, I mean, if we take crypto uh, as one asset class, I mean, you know, there's tremendous amount of uh, innovation going on there uh, and innovation brings opportunity, uh, but also uh, given the, just the scale and breadth of the innovation, there's a lot of confusion too. Um, and a lot of, uh, what are, you know, projects that uh, fly by night operators, if you will, right? So, so as an investor, it's a very, very confusing situation. Uh, you know, so that's on the crypto side. Uh, in your more traditional asset classes like uh, stock markets, uh, I think we are seeing, you know, uh, we might be at, at the peak potentially, right? We don't know, but we might potentially be at the peak uh, in terms of uh, the growth we've been seeing over the last 10, 12 years, right? Uh, since after the financial crisis. So, um, you know, I think the markets are ripe for disruption in that way. Um, so on one hand with crypto asset class, 
uh, finance potentially could get disrupted. So Wall Street, as we know it, and all the financial intermediaries could be disintermediated with what is being called as decentralized finance, DeFi. Um, so there's a lot of innovation happening there, right? So that's one vector, if you will. Um, on the stock market side, I think we are seeing a lot of inflated valuations, um, even in crypto, right? Uh, stemming from you know all the quantitative easing that has happened since 2010, 11, but also, um, through COVID, right? Uh, because of the easing that has been done, um, the money printing that has happened over the last 12 to 18 months. So uh, I think uh, this presents a very, very, what should I say, uh, a hazy picture for an investor. Uh, because on one hand, uh, there's asset inflation, right? Uh, uh, but also on the other hand, um, the number of projects or startups that are seeking to take your money has also increased. So uh, what uh, what has happened because of this is a dynamic where there's a ton of stuff being thrown at investors, uh, if you will. There's just a ton of opportunity, really, <laughs> in every direction you look. Uh, but the uh, question is, OK, how do I really allocate my money in a way uh, that is safe, uh, mature, uh, and you're taking measured risks, right? So that in the event of a downturn um, or in the event of a crypto winter, uh, you are protected to some degree, right? That's that's kind of really the challenge that's, here. So as that's an the biggest investor, question, I guess, uh, how would you <laughs> how would you um, strategize and prepare for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I uh, I personally. Um, uh, you know, have taken, I'm, I'm relatively conservative as an investor, right? Uh, given that I've worked with startups all these years, uh, I have a thesis, I have an idea of what makes for a good startup or uh, a good founding team, right? There are signals that I look for, um, revenues, growth. Uh, so you got to one hand study the numbers to look at the team, right? Uh, what is their track record, right? Have they done a startup earlier? Have they had an exit? Um, if not, who are the other co-investors and so on and so forth. So there's multiple signals that you really look at from an investing standpoint as a, as a VC or even as an angel investor. Um, uh, as an angel investor, you tend to be a little farther removed from the actual investing process. Um, you know, you come a little later in the cycle, maybe potentially depending on your access to deals. Um, uh, but but at the end of the day, you yeah you have to not put all your eggs in one basket. I mean you know that's at one way it is a cliche, it is common sense. But on the other hand, I think uh, investors do tend to get carried away. It is easy. I mean you know we are all creatures of emotion, and uh, uh, there's FOMO on one hand, right, and there's greed on the other hand. Uh, so you got to treat a you know be somewhere in between and not get carried away, uh, right, by all the currents that you're seeing. Because if you're in it. Um, you do, there is a tendency to, you know, sort of FOMO in on um, different deals. So uh, I would say, uh, I mean, you know, have a good distribution between different asset classes, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. um, that will, even in the stock market, right? I mean, the approach I take is, you know, large cap, mid caps, um, <clears throat> even among, you know, the small caps. Uh, yeah, look at, uh, I mean, I am definitely one in crypto, they call a holder, uh, right? Meaning a long-term holder, really, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So that's the general approach I take, right? So I don't tend to come in and out of positions um, just because there's tax implications, number one. Number two, um, it just takes a lot more cycles. Um, so my general disposition is to be a long-term holder. So uh, on in any given asset class. So that way, startup investing suits me very well because, um, you don't have a choice. Uh, your assets are illiquid, really, right? Illiquid, Once you go in, yeah. you it for <laughs> illiquid, illiquid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so, so then, in some ways, yeah, you have to make long-term decisions. You know, so they're not about going in and out uh, in a week or ten days or whatever or a month. Got so, it. So, um, yeah. So I think I my biggest thing is take a long-term view of things. Have you had? Um... I mean, as someone who has uh, invested in startups for how many years now? Um, not too long, actually. Last couple of years, uh, only I'd say mm -hmm. two years or so. Um, any successful? Um, so relative... Any successful exit? Uh, mm -hmm. I've had three eggs. I've had two exits. Um, so uh, not too bad, actually, for a you know two-year time period. Um, so two couple of exits. I've had about. 
I think 80 to 100 investments. So uh, it's still early days. It's still early days. Uh, but from a, uh, if I were to what is called as mark to market valuation, you know, which is <clears throat> just seeing how your assets and portfolio is doing, uh, I think I'm in good shape. So I'm happy to see that because especially when you're, you know, investing, as I said, in a very uncertain uh, situation, especially with startup investing. Um, um, it's entire you you work on limited data unless you know in unlike in you know in a stock market right where you have access to everything that you might need right and all the data is standardized it's gap financials right so you can compare apples to apples if you will uh, but angel and startup investing is um, venture is definitely not of that nature so you always have to work with incomplete information so based on what I can tell um, it's it's been it's been pretty good. Uh, some of my investments have had all on rounds, so which, which I'm very happy to, you know, <clears throat> another round of investment is always a great sign. Um, and maybe, you know, um, your initial bet was correct. Great. I'm, I'm glad you've had some happy exits. <laughs> I mean, it, it is a way of riskier, you know, way riskier form of investing uh, or financial instrument if you don't know what you're doing, right? Yeah. I think so. I think so. You know, a lot of people, um, uh, I'm sure uh, many of your readers know um, that some of startup investing is restricted to accredited investors. And, um, you know, maybe now is a good time to just talk about it a little bit. Uh, accredited investors are, you know, they meet certain threshold and criteria uh, for, you know, in terms of certain metrics of your financial background. And that allows you to access to certain kinds of investment opportunities. Now, um, that is set up by, of course, the government. And there is criticism against that rule saying that it shuts out certain people, which is on one hand, that is correct and true, right? But on the other hand, I think some of these investments are super risky. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe it's not such a bad thing, right? So there's pros and cons. So I take a more nuanced view uh, of that, right? So it's not all bad uh, because, um, you know, uh, if you look at crypto as an asset class, it's it's unregulated, right? It's available, open to everybody. So in that way, it's very democratic, right? Uh, but also on the other hand, I mean, you could lose your life savings if you're not careful. And That's if you, true. you know, you know, yeah, if you're not careful and put your assets into things you shouldn't be, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it's pros and cons, I'd say. So uh, it is definitely a risky asset class. It's venture in general, I think, is risky. Uh, crypto is risky too. Uh, yeah. Let's be honest, right? Uh, it is risky as well. Uh, the degree of volatility that you see <clears throat> in in mm. venture and uh, um, I mean venture as again is illiquid asset class. But crypto, obviously, we see ton of volatility relative to the stock market. You know your traditional public markets. So you have to make sure that you know what you're doing, right? um and access the right kind of sources information um and then maybe you'll be fine right <laughs> but you always have to be on your guard and uh Got it. not put all the eggs in one basket in regards to uh the startups that you invested are they more um what series or um what stage, stage are there are they yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh you know, so a lot of uh, my investing has been through what they call syndicates or SPV, special purpose vehicles. So, um, so what happens is uh, you have the startup and there's a bunch of people investing in the startup. Now, uh, for angel investors uh, like me, um, there might be what is called a special purpose vehicles, uh, also called a syndicates, which essentially pull money from multiple people, multiple investors, and then that SPV is on the what is called as a cap table of the startup. So is it just one uh, startup or multiple startups combined into multiple? Oh, I see. I see. Uh, that would be a fund. Uh, that description, if one, if that would be a fund, actually, if you were, if an entity were to invest in multiple startups, collect money from multiple people and invest in multiple startups, that's essentially a fund. So that's a different structure. But if you collect money from multiple investors and put money in a single startup, uh, that would be a syndicate for a particular single investment. Um, okay. So uh, yeah, so uh, so I have yeah I have done the spectrum actually. Um, so I used to shy away from pre-seed deals. So you know the typical 
So if you were to just look at the life cycle uh, of the funding life cycle of a startup, so you have pre-seed, which is the very, very early stage. I mean, there's these days there's even pre-pre-seed uh, when you're maybe in the idea formation stage, pre-seed, you have some, you have a maybe a demo product going still early. Uh, you know, the team is maybe doing some prototypes, has done, is just started testing, right? Their, their mm -hmm. thesis, if you will, right? Uh, that's pre-seed and then seed stage, uh, you are beginning to show some traction, right? You are beginning to show some traction, and then between seed and Series A um, is when you know you are seeking product market fit. Meaning now you are trying to actually take it to scale and say that hey, this is working. You know you are able to demonstrate product market fit. That's when you come to Series A, and then of course from Series A onwards, it's different growth stages: Series B, Series C, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, the earlier you are in the cycle, the more risky it is. Right, so um, because the failure rate is very high. So earlier you are, the, so for example, in the pre-seed seed stages, potentially 90, 95% of the startups could fail, right? Uh, by the time you come to like a series A, maybe it drops to, you know, the failure rate could drop to 60%, you know? You go to series B, series C, right? Your risk starts dropping. So again, from an asset allocation standpoint, if you're an investor, this is something to think about as well, right? And not only am I doing startup investing, but you also have to think about stages, right? Where is your money going, which stage? So that you are reasonably diversified there as well. So uh, I, as I said, I used to shy away from pre-seed kind of deals uh, because, you know, super risky, uh, but, um, Seed, my, my sweet spot really is seed series A, seed, seed pre series A, what they call, which is, you know, you're in the process of finding product market fit. You have some data that's showing product market fit, but you haven't fully begged it out to get to a series A. So that's kind of my sweet spot, but I think seed series A is kind of where I tend to function. So I have investments there uh, and then subsequently in other stages as well, definitely series B, series C, um, even pre-IPO, right? Because pre-IPO investments tend to be attractive opportunities because um, you know, the com this is a company you might be investing in, which could IPO, you know, or exit in another fashion, maybe acquisition potentially, or just an IPO, right, in 12 to 24 months, potentially, right? Like, those are the kind of short time frames. So from a startup standpoint, 12 to 24 would be a pretty short time frame. While if you were to put money in a seed stage, we are talking about six, eight, 10 years, you know, really, um, uh, unless they get acquired at some point in between. So, so yeah. Anyway, yeah, so I, I have tended to operate through the spectrum, uh, right? Um, yeah, I don't wanna name names, but you know, yeah, a couple of interesting, yeah, uh, uh, I, think, I think some interesting uh, startups definitely out there. Uh, um, crypto startup called Sorare, which is into, uh, you know, um, baseball, like soccer, relating to soccer, gaming. Um, so uh, that's been an interesting um, investment. Um, Another company called Better, which is into mortgages. Um, uh, oh, Better. Yeah. Oh, I know that company. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, how did you uh, get they, into they have a, opportunities? Is all networks, right? Maybe? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, some of these opportunities are available through, you know, different platforms. Depends, depends. Again, uh, right. Uh, again, not to specifically reference these startups, but for uh, uh, your viewers, right? I think. Uh, your, your viewers, I think the first thing to understand is, uh, you know, some opportunities are available for non-accredited investors. That is, doesn't matter. You don't need to be accredited, right? That's one. The other is accredited investing, right? So uh, there are platforms for non-accredited investors. So one example would be Republic, right? Where uh, you would be able to go in and put very small amounts of money, uh, right? As little as, I don't know, $20, $100, $500, right? How do you spell um, it? P U? Uh, uh, Republic. Um, oh, Republic. So R E P U B L I C, Republic.co, for example. I think it's .co. Um, so uh, that is. Um, that's an example of, um, you know, um, sorry about that. So that's an example of a, a startup, a, you know, a platform for non-accredited investors, right? For accredited investors, um, uh, I think the most well-known platform really um, uh, is uh, AngelList, for example, um, which is, yeah, 
uh, as an accredited investor, you get access to, you know, potentially uh, startups, right? Um, now, uh, of course, the third one really is to go independent and invest in startups yourself, which is uh, which is less. I mean, you know, you have to have access to deals, basically, right? Uh, and good quality deals are harder to come by unless you, you know, know the founders and um, mm. so on, uh, or in yeah. right networks, right? Um, then you get access to those um, to those deals. But uh, uh, if your average investor that's looking to get into uh, investing, uh, angel investing, um, I think these two platforms are a good start, I'd say. Um, there are other platforms um, like Republic, um, Micro, I forget the name, Micro, Micro West, maybe if I'm not wrong. But yeah, I think I'd just stick with Republic and Angel. I think those are two good, reputable platforms, I think, um, you know, that you can um, safety kind of look at and uh, figure out what opportunities there are. And so what happens is uh, mm -hmm. in AngelList, uh, let me just describe this a little bit. So if you are an accredited investor, you you get into AngelList, you got to provide documentation that you're an accredited investor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and once you provide uh, the documentation, what happens is there are different syndicates. So so the syndicates are, uh, syndicates are group of investors. So there is a syndicate lead Right, who goes out and um, uh, look for the finds opportunities? Deals. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Right, who yeah. found? Yeah, so there's a syndicate lead who who finds the opportunities, right, and then brings it to the investing group, which is the syndicate, right? And the syndicate then can decide if they want to uh, invest in the opportunity. And the syndicate, uh, it's a um, individuals. The individuals can decide to invest um, on a deal by deal basis, essentially. So, um, so it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, approach there. All right. Thank you uh, so much for sharing. Um, sure. So in regards to, uh, you know, strategies, like, uh, do you happen to have like, um, like a template uh, or table that you can share with the audience on how you evaluate, okay, whether it's, like what criteria needs to be met in order for you to like go ahead and put some 20K or something in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, I can speak to it. I don't have a written uh, document, but uh, happy to, yeah, go over some criteria, I think. So uh, I am big on, uh, from a startup standpoint, I'm big on founding teams, right? So uh, the Sorry, thing what is- are you big on? Uh, uh, the founding team, I said. Oh, the founding the team. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. the thing with startups is that uh, a, a startup is going to pivot multiple times in its life cycle, potentially a few times, definitely early on. Okay. Uh, so what that means is that you start with a certain idea or a thesis, then you realize, but two months down the line, hey, this is not going to work, and then you try something else, and maybe six months later you say, okay, we need to tweak it this way and go you know, take a slight change in direction. So by the time you actually find product market fit, you may have cycled through three or four ideas. Now, what is gonna be constant is really the founders and the founding team, okay? Uh, and the founding team can also change, of course, right? So you could start with three co-founders and then maybe, you know, one, they may not all get along. So maybe one of them might leave the team, right? Uh -huh. uh, and then it's just two of them, right? Like, so even that can change, absolutely. But really uh, startups, in my opinion, and my, my view is that it's a bet on founders, really. Uh, it's less a bet on ideas, more a bet on founders. And if you bet on the right founders, they will go and execute on the right kind of ideas and uh, be able to find product market fit. So uh, I think the first criteria uh, is really, what is the team like, right? What is the credibility of the team? I think mm. is sort of first first criteria, I'd say, right? Uh, the second mm. criteria is uh, the market, uh, meaning what market is this startup operating in, right? That either at least their initial idea that they have, right? Uh, what does the TAM look, the total addressable market? What does the TAM look like um, uh, for for the problem that they're tackling? Is it is it 500 million? Is it 2 billion? Is it 
40 billion, right? Is it 400 billion? I mean, what is the real size of the market, right? I think that becomes super important because, um, um, you know, you know the saying, a rising tide, the rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. So if the market is large enough, then there's a possibility for multiple players to coexist. And so you could have multiple unicorns, you know, like, I mean, you have a Lyft and Uber, uh, right? Like two large entities, right? Only because, mm. yeah, the, the taxi sharing market is so large, right? So uh, so that's a very important criteria, right? Uh, so smaller markets means this opportunity. Uh, and, you know, as a VC, um, you're looking for home runs, right? I mean, you, you're looking for big bets that pay off. Um, uh, bets that pay off big rather, right? Because you're going to have so many failures in your portfolio. That's the, just the fact of life. So if you invest in pre-seed seed, seed stages, you are going to expect that 90%. Um, so what they say is that out of 10 startups that you invest in, right, uh, maybe five, six of them are just going to fail outright, five or six of them, right? Uh, maybe two or three of them are going to do okay. Maybe you're going to get a 4x return, maybe, um, you know, 4 to 6x, maybe. And then one or two potentially could be, a, you know, the home run which is, I don't know, 20X or 50X, 100X, you know, it could just depend. So that one winner is going to cover all your losses that you have across the portfolio. So that's a general thought process for a VC standpoint, right? So you are going for the home runs. And um, um, so, for example, Mitch Kapoor, uh, who's partner at um, Anderson Horowitz uh, in his book says, uh, it's better to, I mean, as an investor, uh, as a VC, you have to err on the side of failing than on the side of, uh, like you gotta be in as many deals as possible, right? Mm -hmm. So, because you can't afford to miss out on that one deal, right? That might really go big, you see? That might go big, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see, so yeah, so not to say that, say that you have to spread yourself thin, but that's a general approach. So even as an annual investor, because you know, you're gonna have a lot of deals thrown at you um, every day, uh, tens of deals every day, potentially, uh, depending on your appetite and, you know, what you're open to, but uh, um, you have to pick and choose. And so you have to develop a point of view, a, a bird's eye view of what's going on. Uh, what are the sectors that you're comfortable with, not comfortable with, right? I mean, for example, I mean, are you comfortable with uh, robotics, for example, or investing in pharma, right? Uh, versus investing in a supply chain um, startup or uh, fintech, right? They are very different things, right? Uh, mm. uh, uh, robotics would be deep tech, you know, a uh, much deeper understanding of engineering and so on and so forth. Uh, while you look at fintech, etc., it's a different skill set. It's more market oriented, trends where the market is going. Not to say that that's not important, robotics, but might be much more engineering heavy. So you got to understand what is your strengths and weaknesses, and like you know, what, yeah, and then just kind of hone in on your strengths and stay there. Because if you spread yourself too thin, uh, potentially, uh, you know, you could go wrong. Uh, the chances, the risk profile increases of your investment portfolio. So anyway, so team, right? TAM, right? The market size, right? One, two, uh, three would be, what do the metrics look like of the startup, right? I mean, uh, where is this, right? Is there some data or is it just a PowerPoint deck, right? They haven't given started, right? Um, if they have data, what kind of data is it, right? Is it uh, just test data, trial data, or is it actually the product is operational, people are using it? Okay, if people are using it, the next question would be, are these paying customers or are they just using it for free, right? So some startups might show traction to say that, hey, these we have seen heavy engagement uh, with our users, but we don't have any paying customers yet. Then the next step would be, hey, not only do we have engagement, but we actually have 200 paying customers and each of them is paying whatever, $1,000 each, you know? Uh, so that makes for a different story, right? So you got to really tease apart uh, this data to understand, okay, where does the startup sit, right? And um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, how attractive is the opportunity, right? So that would be three, right? And and I could go on metrics, diff, many different metrics that can come into play. So I'm not going to kind of dive into that unless we want to. But uh, the fourth uh, thing I would say is who is investing with you, alongside you, or who are you investing alongside, right? I mean, are there some prominent investors? Uh, are there some prominent VCs maybe, right? What is the background? Maybe it's a VC in, that you're not familiar with, but maybe look them up find out what their team is like, what are their strengths, right? So for example, um, let's say uh, you see, um, <clears throat> if you see a, a startup deal where um, the co-founder Zillow is investing and it happens to be a real estate investment, um, a real estate startup, credibility, for example, right? Oh, the person, right, knows, um, given that he or she ran Zillow, uh, they know, uh, so so that's a signal, right? That's a positive signal. So then you get some confidence. So it, it you really have to kind of look at uh, that as well to understand who you are investing alongside. Um, Got it. Yeah, if it's uh, A16Z, I guess you probably would jump on it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. I would say so, though, I mean, I passed on, I passed on a deal uh, where they were investors. Uh, uh, so I should also qualify that different investors have different reasons to put in money, right? So you could be a large university endowment, right? You know, from one of the Ivy League colleges in the United States, mm -hmm. and uh, you have a massive endowment and you are looking to spread your bets, right? So you are going to go way broader than somebody as an angel investor might be able to. So just because you see a large endowment, you know, you know, see endowment investing doesn't mean you jump in. Um, so again, you know, signals also need to be qualified, right? Uh, not all signals are the same and uh, you don't just jump in because there's a big name in there. But certainly, uh, I mean, Warren's homework, right? The moment you see a big name, okay, you say, oh, okay, there's something here, right? Why is, I don't know, a soft bank or A16Z, right? Uh, or an Axel, right, is investing in here, right? So you could uh, potentially, yeah, do a little bit more homework um, and see what uh, needs to be done there. So yeah, but you always, as they say, uh, in crypto, divide your right? Do your own research. So don't- uh... Yeah, I mean, as I'm really amazed. Like you, you do so many things. How do you juggle your time? I mean, you're also working full time. So I'm sure you must be like, really busy like how do you <laughs> yeah right, it's amazing right. i have i have two kids to boot as well so <laughs> you have it is, it is hard. two kids is hard. you said two kids yeah two yeah. kids as well two young ones so um mm -hmm. no it is hard um i'm i'm i think i've gotten better at it with time uh but yeah it is it is tough uh, right so when you are sort of multiple things uh, going by on your radar, right? Uh, but I've learned to prioritize as well, right? So of course, uh, your full-time role is important. You gotta do uh, what is necessary there, number one. Number two, uh, I think uh, with, with, with the deal flow, right? Uh, you have to be choosy. Um, uh, yeah, meaning you can't just like, right? Over time you get, you your antennae kind of get sharper, right? What to look for, right? I think is also, uh, kind of you have a better sense. So uh, for example, when you speak to founders, um, you begin to develop a sense for what might make a good founder, actually, you know, like there is such a thing as, you know, so founders have to be able to attract talent, right? Um, I mean, they have to be able to execute um, flawlessly, hopefully, right? Uh, uh, so, and, and, and understand where the market is going, right? Uh, be able to build product, so there's multiple aspects, but really um, uh, the, the subjectivity in some of these things comes down to, you know, how do people perceive founders and what, what people think could make for a good founder, you know? So there's, there's some aspects as well. So when you're investing directly, um, there is a little bit of that also uh, one has to kind of gauge. Um, so, um, but yeah, no, I think uh, it's, it's, it's hard. So uh, I definitely, it's not easy <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh there's too many things uh, going by right yeah um so i mean we touched about the uh, strategy so why um why should um 
people invest in angel um what's the main um catch here and the biggest difference between um you know angel and other you know investing in or financial instruments you know like stocks bonds um crypto right. uh or even real estate you know there's so many opportunities out right. there mm -hmm. right right yeah, so I think, uh, uh, I mean, if you were to just compare asset classes, right? I mean, stock mm -hmm. markets, we are talking about, you know, six to 10% a year, right? Um, um, except the past few years. <laughs> Sorry, except for the last few years, yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, the long term, if you talk about long term returns, right? Uh, it's in that range, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, if you were aggressive during the pandemic, of course, you know, you probably made a killing, right? Uh, uh, but I mean, I come from the place of being a fairly conservative investor and good steward of your money. Uh, uh, just, yeah, not putting all your eggs into one basket, right? So from, from that perspective, so we have, we have, traditional stocks and bonds, right? Um, so that's six to eight, 12 percent. Um, and bonds, of course, right? Tending to zero almost. Um, uh, real estate, I'm not sure. Maybe is it like three to four percent? What do you say, Cindy? I don't know. What's the uh, uh, rate of return? I think including appreciation and rental, probably about about five to 10 percent, depending on the five area. Yeah, depending on the area okay. as well, because every area is different. Right, 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 right. So mm -hmm. you have real estate, right? Uh, stocks and bonds, you have crypto. So crypto, of course, you can see massive appreciation, uh, but depends, right? It all depends. So uh, you there's very significant risk uh, and so do does angel investing. So I think angel and crypto come into, uh, into that part of the bucket of your investment portfolio where you should allocate a small portion, right? So. Uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago, crypto allocation perhaps used to be 1%. Now maybe people say 5%, 3 to 5%, you know. Uh, I would put angel investing also in the same bucket, right? So maybe between angel and crypto, potentially you think about, you know, I mean, this is not investment advice. I'm not an advisor, right? Uh, so this is just my point of view. Uh, but depending on your familiarity with the sector, I mean, it all depends on how familiar you are with things, right? So, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, more the familiarity, I think the better you would perform, right? Uh, but you would carve out a small portion of your overall portfolio for these kind of risky bets, essentially, in Joel and crypto, right? Uh, and the reason why, I mean, is kind of not obvious, but I think technology is moving so fast, right? Uh, I think we are going to see some tremendous growth over the next eight to 10 years, right? And I mean, that's why venture capital exists, right? I mean, venture capital came into being in the 60s, um, you know, right, Sand Hill Road. Um, I mean, we have seen a ton of innovation in the past 40, 50, 60 years. So we first had semiconductors, then we have had, you know, the internet and the internet in the last 20, 25 years has brought massive gains, right, in that sector. So question is, we are in 2020, 2021, what are we going to see? What's the run going to look like between 2021 to 2040, right? <laughs> so if you had invested in Amazon in 90, whatever, right, 2000, right? Uh, right. I mean, you're going to be reaping the gains in 2021, assuming you held on to it, that is, or a Tesla for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> if you invested early on in 2008, nine uh, and held on till now. So, I mean, one of the things is, of course, are you able to hold on is also a big question. But, um, uh, but so, so that cannot, question cannot be ignored, right? So uh, I think angel investing easily, I mean, my understanding, uh, what they call internal rate of return, uh, right? I think on angel funds and investments could be in the range of 16 to 20% potentially year on year compounded, right? So it's, it's almost double 20 to 60%, is that? Uh, no, I said 16 to 20, 16 to 20%. 16 to 20, okay, gotcha. 16 to 20, right? But but that's annual returns, right? But you keep compounding it, the mass, the difference could be massive, right? Of a 10% growth portfolio, stock market portfolio versus a 16% angel portfolio, right? Um, the differences are gonna be quite stark, right? So, so I think, I think it cannot be ignored. So technology in general, technology investing, I don't think should be ignored. Um, that's my general point of view, right? Um, so then you have angel investments, which is across the broad swath of technology sectors, right? 
uh, and crypto happens to be one of them, right? So now you zero in on crypto and you say, okay, what about crypto, right? Uh, and I think crypto is a very interesting asset class. I think there's a ton of innovation going on, going on there. And the beauty of crypto really is that access is open, okay? So as we discussed earlier, right? You don't need to be an accredited investor. You don't need access to deal flow. I mean, by and large, crypto is an open community. Uh, a lot of it is available, right? Again, there are venture investors investing in crypto projects, right? That you may not be able to participate in, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, right? 90%, 80% of the tokens are available in the open market at some point or another. And you can go in and, you know, if you have a thesis, if you have studied the market, you can go in and invest. So that is a very rare opportunity, honestly, right? That's not available in other angel um, investing sort of situations. So I'd say, so the why is obvious. I mean, my, my feeling is that crypto, I mean, is going to, do very well in the next five to 10 year time frame, right? I mean, I look at A16Z, right? I mean, they just recently raised a $2 billion fund, maybe in April, maybe I'm gonna say, yeah, probably a couple of months ago, right? Uh, and before then they raised smaller rounds, right? So, um, so the amount of money coming into crypto as a percentage of the venture equity class, venture capital class, asset class is growing actually. You know, so I think crypto as an asset class should not be ignored. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there. And again, you got to, um, I mean, you know, I mean, one way to draw the parallel is just like you have the Google fans, right? Google, Amazon, Netflix, or Facebook. Uh, in the mm -hmm. tech sector, you have those kind of parallel names in the crypto ecosystem. So maybe, you know, you got to, yeah, if you have a portfolio in crypto, you got to balance it appropriately so that you have some of the more stable, bigger names in there, right? So that you experience this volatility, balance that with some smaller names, you know, more riskier bets, right? But got you got to, again, you know, so, so yeah, you, so, your question was why. Yeah, it's, uh, it's because of the growth that's possible, you know, with technology. Got it. Um, <laughs> what, was I, what was I about to say? I kind of suddenly forgot, but yeah. Um, Oh, you know, um, uh, just one comment, um, mm -hmm. just one comment, um, uh, you know, in crypto, one thing we could touch on, which I, which I did mention is what are the areas, right, within crypto? Why? I mean, another way of answering why is not just that, hey, it's going to grow in the next five to 10 years. Okay, so what exactly, right? What, what innovation is going to come out of it, right? So I think one specific area is decentralized finance, what it's called, right, which is, uh, Disintermediating, disintermediating centralized entities in the financial ecosystem, right? So if you, let's say we have a NASDAQ or NYSE, right? Which disintermediate, which intermediates the trades that a buyer and seller might do, right? Now, crypto has the potential as an opportunity to sort of replace some of those with automated algorithms essentially, right? Uh, so that's an interesting sort of scenario. And that's just one scenario, right? Uh, um, another one, of course, I mean, you know, everyone potentially on the call also, you know, who's listening to us knows about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, right? And there, I mean, we are going through, potentially going through a bubble right now or there, but that doesn't uh, take away the tremendous potential of the underlying technology there. So we are going to see a lot of innovation there. And Twitter, in fact, has made some announcements around it as well, right? Twitter, for example, the Bitcoin tipping that Twitter has recently started. Uh, they're going to do NFT authentication, right? Things like that, um, you know, are all basically sitting on a crypto um, underneath, right? Crypto layer, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah. In, in I mean, regards to um, talking about, uh, you said diversifying. So how are you allocating your portfolio on all these different asset classes? Mm -hmm. Are we talking about crypto or? Uh, no, like your, put, your own portfolio. Overall? Yeah, how are you allocating your your portfolio? Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm I'm a little over indexed, so I shouldn't be an example uh, because I mean I, I come from the tech world, right? So I just have greater confidence um, and I just mm -hmm. feel more comfortable, right? Putting my money where my mouth is, if you will, in terms of my beliefs and what I think is going to do well, right? Uh, but I'd say maybe um, I mean I haven't calculated the exact percentages, but I'd say, I mean, I have crypto is more maybe like 10, 20% of my portfolio, 
Yeah, potentially, right? Angel is another 10, 20%. So that puts us at like 30, 40%, and maybe another 60% is your traditional stock market investments. So how about real estate? That is how you don't invest. real estate. No, no, none, none. Well, actually, hold on. No. Um, I have some uh, investments uh, via, again, syndicates and funds, actually. I do, but not, not primary real estate investments. Um, so, so these are funds who are investing in, for example, single family real estate homes. Right. Got it, got so, it, got it. yeah, so that's, that's the I mean, you're also but, buying your own property, right? The one that you're living in. Um, yes, yes, that's on the cards, but uh, right. Yeah, yeah. but that's not really, yeah, that's that's not, uh, I wouldn't call that as an investment. It's more like, you know, when you're buying. For your own, right? yeah. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, so, so yeah, yeah that's, uh, but but certainly again, not, not financial advice, right? Uh, do your own research. Uh, uh, I would say, yeah. For, for people who are not familiar with technology, right? Uh, I think they should proceed with caution, right? And be careful um, with how they allocate their, their assets. Great, um, so majority, like 60% is in the stock market. That's quite heavy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, look, I mean, of course, banks, no good, <laughs> right? Uh, um, so, I would say actually maybe it's more like 50-50, right? I mean, I said 60-40, maybe it's 50-50 almost, right? Um, uh, mm-hmm. Now that I think about it, just because some of my angel investments have grown faster naturally, right? Compared to my stock market investments. So what started more like 30, 35%, maybe has gone to 50% already, you know, as a percentage oh, yeah. of the overall portfolio. Yeah, so uh, yeah, because yeah, crypto and angel investments tend to grow much faster especially in these past year, year and a half, right? Got it. A pretty big growth, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, any any final thoughts or practical tips for um, new expiring um, angel investors or um, crypto investors that you have? Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'd say... Um, be choosy, I don't know. So first of all, uh, do your homework, right? Do your research, mm-hmm. uh, get familiar um, with, with the landscape, right? Don't be in a hurry to invest. And I think one of the, one of the more sort of, um, yeah, one piece of advice I think for angel investors uh, is that please diversify. I think that's an important one. So, uh, you know, I think people can get carried away and decide, hey, this one is really big, I'm gonna put, my money in here. And then as we said, you know, well, the failure rate is 90%, 90, 95%. So there's a very high probability, uh, right? Because of unforeseen circumstances, uh, you could lose your money. So uh, the best advice potentially is diversification of returns. In fact, I mean, I put this up on my Twitter profile, I think um, uh, there's some research that shows, you know, how a diversified portfolio, angel portfolio will do way better than, um, than a non-diversified portfolio. So simple. I mean, and this is, we know this is true for traditional stock markets too, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something to keep in mind. I think this is an important piece of advice, right? That's one. But two, also don't put money in stuff that you don't understand, right? I mean, yeah, you have to become familiar, get to know it, right? And start, yeah, again, start small. Don't go to the deep end. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, Start on the shallow end. Feel your way. Right, and then slowly, um, and maybe have have some buddies, you know, uh, who probably potentially interested in doing this along with you, right? Um, that that's a good strategy too, because then you get exchange ideas and maybe the audience can are. reach out to you <laughs> for. Oh, absolutely! Happy to, happy to, uh, happy to, you know, um, chat with anybody else um, that might be interested. Please do reach out. Uh, I leave my Twitter handle and LinkedIn as well. Um, right. Folks can yeah I will, um, we will post it on the YouTube description so if anyone wants to reach out to Rajesh please feel free yeah mm-hmm. awesome all right thank you so Good. much for your time and um, really happy to that you joined us today <laughs> absolutely Cindy thank you thank you for having me on the show and um, 
this is awesome. Thanks for uh, doing this. Looking okay. forward to see you in the next one. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye.